quantification of reaction rate. The first part we're going to cover is to talk about how to quantify average reaction rate and instantaneous reaction rate. When you look at average reaction rate, you're looking at the concentration change over a span of time delta t. For example, in this graph here, we can now take the concentration change of the reactant, C4H9Cl, they have decreased from here to here. So that is the amount of concentration that has changed and it has taken place over the time delta t. So we can substitute inside here and calculate that as the average rate of reaction. And in the average rate of reaction, the unit will be concentration divided by time. Therefore, the unit of reaction rate will be mole per dm cube per second or mole per dm cube per minute. Let's take a look at instantaneous rate of reaction. In the calculation of instantaneous rate of reaction, similarly, we'll need a graph that plots the concentration of reactant versus time. And if we want to find the instantaneous rate of reaction at 350 seconds, we will now draw the tangent at time equal to 50 seconds. And from the tangent itself, we'll find the gradient of the tangent. And from there, we can actually calculate the initial rate of reaction and we'll take the change in the concentration divided by change in time. Bear in mind that in both cases, the change in concentration is negative. So um, as far as chemists is concerned, they like to work with positive number. They will either take the modulus of the change of the concentration or if not, they put a negative sign to make sure they end up the average rate of reaction or the instantaneous rate of reaction, both are actually positive in numbers. Let us now take a look how we actually express the rate of reaction. We can express them in the form of a rate equation. So rate equation, is a formula that is used to calculate the rate of reaction, which is largely dependent on the concentration of reactants. Hence, rate of reaction is equal to concentration of reactant, in this case, respectively A and B, raised to the power of M and N with a proportionality constant K. M and N is actually termed as the order of reaction. So M is the order of reaction with respect to A, while N is the order of reaction with respect to B. M plus N will be the overall order of reaction. And it's important to bear in mind that the order of reaction is independent of the stoichiometric constant. Meaning to say, if one if in the stoichio constant, one more of A reacts with one more of B to give C and D, the order of reactions M and N is not derived by looking at the stoichio constants. Rate constant. Rate constant is a constant of proportionality in the rate equation, and its unit can actually vary. So say, for example, we take a look at this example of rate equation. So in this rate equation that we have, the overall order of reaction is three and the concentration of A and B would actually be depicted here. So it will be more per dm cube raised to the power of three. As far as the unit of a reaction rate is concerned, it's more per dm cube per second. So thereafter, we can work out the unit of the rate constant. Half-life. Half-life is the time taken for the initial concentration of the reactant to, to fall to half its value. So if you start off with the initial concentration of 0.1 more per dm cube, say for example, looking at this graph, it drops down to 0.5, so therefore, the half-life in this graph is 350 seconds. And from 0.05, it will drop further down to 0.025. So you can see that the half-life, again, is from 350 to 700, which means it's another half-life of 350 seconds. So the example that we cited here indicates that the half-life is constant. We'll now take a look at uh, what are the factors that affect reaction rate that you were taught in O-level. These are the respective factors. First, the concentration of your aqueous reactant. Uh, or the partial pressure of gas reactant, which is also a measure of the concentration of the gaseous reactant, the catalyst, the temperature, and the surface area of the solid reactants or catalyst. Based, so based on the rate equation that we discussed earlier, only the concentration of reactant seems to be factored inside the rate equation. There's actually another form of the rate equation that we can express it, which is to express it in terms of the partial pressure, since partial pressure is synonymous to the concentration of reactant. So you can see the proof for that uh, being circled here. Hence, a good question to ask, is where are all these factors being factored in the rate equation? So these factors are all factored inside the rate constant. And there's actually an Ahernis equation. We state that the rate constant is equal to A exponential negative EA divided by RT. A is actually the surface area of the solid reactants or catalyst. If those surface area becomes larger, then the value of A will become larger. Temperature is represented here, while catalyst is represented via the activation energy for the reaction. Now we take a look at the various graphs that you need for your A-level. Total in the A-level, you need to know zero order, first order, and second order reactions, and the total of seven graphs that you need to know, respectively, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the seventh one is this one. These are the seven graphs that has been asked commonly at A-level or in exam. 
Let's start off with zero order. When it comes to zero order, given that rate is equal to K, so when you decide to sketch the reaction rate versus the concentration, it's actually just a horizontal line. When you're starting the reactant time graph, remember that the gradient is the reaction rate. So therefore, in this case, if the reaction rate is constant, the gradient has to be constant. So therefore, it's a straight line with a negative gradient. In the case of a product time graph, it will be a straight line with a positive gradient. And important to take note that the gradient is a rate constant K, similarly in the same vein. For the case of the reactant time graph, the gradient is actually your con rate constant K, first order. In the first order graph, rate is equal to K to a concentration of uh, A. In this case, when you sketch reaction rate versus con A, the gradient is actually the rate constant. When you sketch the reactant versus the time graph, bear in mind that the half-life is constant. So the time it takes from C0 to go to C0 over 2, that time that it takes is actually termed as a half-life. It will be, say for example, it will be T. For C0 over 2, to go to a quarter C0, it will take another equal half-life T. So therefore, with the bear in mind, when it comes to first order graph, if you have an exponential decaying light graph, you have an exponential decaying graph that you observe, you need to undertake, undertake the steps to check whether half-life is constant. If half-life is constant, then it's a first, first order uh, reaction graph. Let's take a look at the product time graph. In the product time graph, when time is zero, we use a pie chart to represent all the reactants that's inside. When time goes to infinite, all the reactant is converted to product. So in the first half-life, what we have is that half of the reactant is now converted to product. So in the first half-life, you have P0 over 2, which is the reason why in the exam, if given this graph, and we have to determine whether the half-life is constant and therefore conclude it's a first order graph. We have to first determine the maximum amount of product that can be produced. And, at, and most of the time, this is derived stoichiometrically. It's not based on the asymptote that you can mark on the graph. So after determining the maximum amount of product that can be produced, which is P0, you are now able to work out P0 over 2. So from P0 over 2, I'm now able to actually extrapolate and determine the first half-life. In the second half-life, if this reaction is a first order graph, then what you have is that now you're only left with only a quarter of the reactant. Three quarter of the reactant would have been chemically converted, which means in this case now, you will have three quarter R0. So you can now look for three quarter R0 and from three quarter R0, you can again extrapolate and actually obtain the second half-life. And if T1 is approximated as T2, then we can confirm the half-life is constant and therefore reaction is first order. If you want to do a further check, we can still do one more point, which is that now in this case, if the third half-life has passed, has passed, if the three half-lives has passed, you're left with only one eighth of the reactant. If you're left with one eighth of the reactant, the amount of the maximum product is formed is seven over eight. So in this case, you can label seven over eight and you can actually determine your third half-life. So that's how you determine half-life for a product time graph that may be first order. The final graph that you need to know comes from second order. In the second order reaction, R is equal to K con A squared. So therefore, if you sketch reaction rate versus concentration of A, you ought to get a straight line with a gradient K. That will prove that the reaction is second order. Let us now take a look at pseudo order reaction. So the first one we're going to study is pseudo zero order. So let, so let us first explain. In any chemical reactions, you typically have more than a couple of reactants. For, and it is not possible for you to allow all the concentration of the reactants to change and to try and thereafter determine the order of reactions for each of the specific reactants. The way to deal with it is only to allow concentration of one of the reactants to, to decrease with time, while the other two remains largely unchanged. So for example, in these questions, we could actually have the concentration of your Br- and H plus to be in large excess. If these two is in large excess, so we can say that the concentration of Br- and H plus essentially does not change and it is a constant. So we can subsume them together with a rate constant K to give a new rate constant K prime. So this is how we pack down a reaction, which otherwise is, has a total order of reaction of four to becomes a pseudo first order reaction. So the word pseudo means fake, means that you are focused on only one reactant. Let's take a look at how we can make use of pseudo zero order reaction to determine the order of reactions for propanon and iodine is reacting in the presence of a catalyst H+. In the design of this experiment, we want the propanon and the H+, to be in large excess. So psychometrically, you can calculate and determine the specific volume of H+, and propanon to be used, ensuring that they are in large excess relative to the amount of iodine solution that we use, which will be a limiting agent. Once you pour it inside, you can start your stopwatch. 
you'll withdraw a fixed amount of a reacting mixture using pipette. At times equal to three minutes, you will then pour in 100 cm cube of water to quench the reaction. So at the third minute, we have to quench the reaction in the conical flask. The idea is to pour in sufficient water to reduce the concentration of the reactant to a very low concentration, so much so that the reaction rate is neg negligible. Then from there, we can titrate the titra with a standard solution of sodium, sodium sulfate. And from there, we'll be able to determine the concentration of iodine. So this is the concentration of iodine at the third minute. When, it, when, time, when the stopwatch reaches six minutes, you repeat the same process, which means pour in 100 cm cube of water to quench the reaction reacting mixture in the conical flask, and thereafter titrate it with thiosulfate based on the and to determine the concentration of iodine. So in, by repeating for the rest of the other samples, you will then be able to plot a graph based on the concentration of reactant versus the time. From this graph, you will know that it is actually a straight line graph. It's a straight line graph with a negative gradient. When you plot the graph for concentration of iodine versus time, this graph would coincide with the zero order reaction graph. So therefore, we can conclude to say that with respect to iodine is zero order. And the reaction that we are now studying is a pseudo zero order reaction. If you were to decide to repeat the experiment with a change initial concentration of your iodine, which initially in our first experiment, we may start to use a concentration of iodine as 0.1 mole per dm cube. But if you decide to start with 0.2 mole per dm cube, you will actually end up with the data as marked on the graph. You end up with a straight line with the same gradient. Okay, Why is the gradient the same? The gradient is the same because in this design of the experiment, we are making propanol and H plus to be in large excess. Because they are in large excess, their concentration stays relatively unchanged. Therefore, in the pseudo order reaction, the rate constant of the pseudo zero order reaction is K prime. And K prime is therefore equal to K, concentration of H plus to the power A and concentration of propanol to the power C. And also bear in mind that since with respect to iodine is a zero order graph, the gradient, the negative gradient of the graph is actually also equal to K prime. Hence, if we were to repeat the experiment where we change the concentration of iodine and keep the concentration of H plus and propanol the same, the gradient of the line that is obtained should be the same. After determining the order of reaction with respect to iodine, how do we now determine the order of reaction with respect to H plus and order of reaction with respect to propanol? The way to do that now is still to keep H plus and propanol in large excess. However, we will now change the concentration of H plus. So when we change the concentration of H plus and repeat the experiments and replot the graph, this is the graph that we get. So we can now compare the negative gradient of the graph, which is a minus G1 and minus G2, which is actually equal to K concentration of your H plus, which in this case is 0.1 relative to G1. And in the case of 0.2 mole per dm cube, when the concentration of H plus is 0.2 mole per dm cube is relative to the gradient G2. And therefore, when you compare this using these two equation, we will then be able to derive the order of reaction with respect to A. To determine the order of reaction with respect to propanol, we can repeat the same process, except now what we do is that we vary the concentration of your propanol. And then we also compare the negative gradient. And thereafter, be able to derive the order of reaction with respect to propanol and derive the value of C. In summary, when you want to determine the order of reaction with respect to reactants in the chemical reactions, you typically will need to have a pseudo order reaction. So in this example that we illustrate, we use pseudo zero order. And thereafter, we change the concentration of the other reactants that we want to know is order of reaction. And we compare the gradients in order to derive those, or, those unknown order of reactions. Let's take a look at pseudo first order. Using the same example, let us take a look at pseudo first order reaction. In this example, we want to look at the pseudo first order reaction. In this case, with respect to propanol. So to do that, we need to make sure that the concentration of H plus and iodine are in large excess. And by doing, making sure they are in large excess, the K prime therefore is equal to K to the concentration of H plus to the power one and concentration of iodine to the power zero. Since the order of reaction with respect to iodine is zero, we can actually uh, remove that from the expression. So the K prime is equal to K concentration of H plus to the power one. And bear in mind that when it comes to pseudo first order reaction, we have to know that after we determine the half-life, the half-life is related to the rate constant via a formula, which earlier when we introduced the graphs of the first order reactions, we did not add on. This is the time we need to add on to say that you have to memorize it. For all first order reaction, if you know the half-life, 
then k is equal to ln 2 divided by t half. So this formula will not be given to you in the data booklet. You have to memorize it and use it only for first order reaction. Since for first order reaction, the t half is constant or the half life is constant. So based on that, we now can relate k concentration of H plus to ln 2 divided by t half. In short, if you alter the concentration of H plus, your half life will change. Let's now take a look at the graphs. In the graphs of propanon versus time, the graph will be an exponential decay graph. And in fact, the half-life ought to be constant. So let's take a look. If you start with 0.13, this will be when, it, when the concentration goes to 0 0.15 mole per dm cube. This is the first half-life. When from 0.15, it goes to 0.75, this will be the second half-life. So as you can see down here, both the half-life, both the first and second half-life are the same signifying that the graph is a first order reaction graph with respect to propanon. In the next graph that we look at, we're sketching propanon versus time. But what is the highlight is that the concentration of H plus has now doubled. So in the first graph, the concentration of H plus is 0.1 mole per dm cube. In the second graph is 0.2. Say, assuming we now need to use this graph to determine the order of reaction with respect to, with respect to H plus. So what we do is that we take a look at 0.1 mole per dm cube. So for 0.1 mole per dm cube, the half-life is actually as such, which is actually uh, two squares. And the second half-life is also two squares. So therefore, we can say that the half-life, when the concentration of H plus is 0.1 mole per dm cube, we can let it be 2t. Let's take a look at the half-life when the concentration of H plus is 0.2 mole per dm cube. When the H plus is 0.2 mole per dm cube, the first half-life is actually only one square. And the second half-life is also one square. So therefore, in this case, when the concentration of H plus is 0.2 mole per dm cube, I'll let the half-life be only t. So from here, we know that k prime is equal to k concentration of H plus to the power of a. And obviously, we, in, this, in this question, we can assume that the order of reaction with respect to iodine is zero. So we remove it. And this is equal to ln 2 over t half. So we can now establish a relationship when the concentration of H plus changes, the T half will change. The concentration of H plus to the power A is inversely proportional to T half. So when the concentration of H plus is 0 0.1 mole per dm cube, raised to the power A, the T half will be this, is 2T. We'll now then take a look at the T half so when the concentration of H plus is 0 0.2 mole per dm cube, then the time, the, the T half is actually T. So from this mathematical expression derived based on the relationship here, we're able now to determine the value of A. Because if you look at this bit, you will find that, uh, so mathematically, you will find that half to the power of A, half to the power of A is actually equal to half. So therefore, we can conclude respect to H plus is a chief first order.